Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Online Lunchtime Talk. These talks are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room TVs. And from next week, they will be live again from the building. That's right, we are delighted to say that we're moving to a hybrid model for our talks. So the talks will continue to be online for those that you can't be with us in person, but will also now be live from the building as well. And you can book tickets now for our next two talks and there are very limited places available. So as we continue to have some elements of social distancing, so please get booking and come say hello. We can't wait to see you all. Uh, I'm Luke Emery, I'm the Pervasive Media Studio producer. I'm a white man with a large ginger beard and a small mohawk, and I am wearing a t-shirt that says, the enemy of the working class travels by private jet, not migrant dinghy, which is a quote from Zara Zoltana. The pictures behind me are all our upcoming talks and events in the studio. Um, these talks are our chance to throw open the doors of the pervasive media studio, and for you to hear more from the people who are part of the community or who are working on things that excite us. And especially big welcome to any of you out there who are new to what we do, for whom this might be the first time you're engaging with us. Here's a little bit more about us. The studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between the Watershed, the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. And we're a home for embryonic ideas, research and development and the building of new companies. We're a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We offer studio space, desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities all for free for our residents. And we're a place for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. In this week's talk, Dr. Stuart Andrews and Dr. Patrick Duggan will be reflecting on their ongoing project, which looks into the ways in which the arts are vital to city responses to a pandemic. More on that from them shortly. A captioned recorded version of this talk will be available after the talk is finished, as it is every week. And before we start, next week's talk is the first one live from the building since COVID uh, caused us to go into lockdown for the first time. Um, obviously, we are very excited. Uh, in this lunchtime talk, Catelyn Shepherd will reshare her research and findings arising from her practice and research PhD, which is called Caring to Listen, which examines how working class experience is often excluded from, from socially engaged art. You can get news on that talk and all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio. Following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive News Studio on Instagram or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget, while you're sat there listening to me talk, hit subscribe to this YouTube channel so you don't miss out on all our latest content. And while you're there, give this video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And now I'm really pleased to hand over to Stuart and Patrick. Thank you very much. Um... I'd like to, Hi everybody. everyone should introduce themselves briefly, briefly. I'm Stuart Andrews. I'm a lecturer in theatre and research lead in theatre at Brunel University, London. Uh, hello, I'm Patrick Duggan. I'm a white man with uh, short cropped uh, brown hair and a beard. I'm wearing a pink shirt and a blue jumper. Uh, I am Associate Professor of Performance and Culture at Northumbria University, where I'm also Head of Theatre and Performance. So we're going to introduce uh, some of our work to date. We're going to give some context on the work we've done, which focuses on arts and performance and ways in which they intersect with resilience. And we suggest there's more scope for engagement with resilience. We're going to talk about our current project where we're focusing particularly on COVID and how arts and resilience can engage with that. And we're going to focus particularly on a report that we produced and released last month uh, where we reflect on our interim findings. So we'll share some of those findings uh, and hopefully this talk will be a chance to put those into conversation. Um, conversation is quite key to the work that we do. Uh, we're often uh, engaged in talking with artists, with uh, venue managers, with arts practitioners in varying uh, roles in cities, uh, and also with resilience professionals who are engaged in developing and implementing strategy in those cities. And it's about brokering connections between those groups. So we hope that will be of relevance here. Um, the project that we run, <clears throat> the overarching project of which the COVID project sits within it is called Performing City Resilience. And we've worked on this for a few years now. Uh, we're interested as the strapline says in the art and culture of city resilience. Uh, so we facilitate new modes of resilience building by bringing internationally tested theories of performance to local understandings of the challenges faced by particular communities, councils and organisations. So uh, while our core business is looking at how arts practitioners and resilience practitioners might uh, develop inter interconnected practices or how their work might speak productively to one, to one another, uh, we're 
focus, we focus that kind of work on challenges that cities face. So COVID is a key challenge, but we're also interested in uh, a raft of challenges that cities are addressing uh, in the current moment. And in that work, we define resilience uh, quite broadly uh, and, and acknowledge the challenges that the term brings with it in its plural forms of deployment, both in kind of neoliberal contexts of doing more with less, but also more positively within city infrastructural thinking and the ways in which cities function. And as Stuart says, the, the challenges they face. The first bit of the work that we did on this project was in New Orleans, and we thought it might be useful to outline some of that work as context for the COVID work. So very briefly, in 2018, we went to New Orleans on a survey phase of field research where we conducted interviews with um, uh, stakeholders across the city from arts, cultural backgrounds, uh, culture bearers and stakeholders, funders in the city, and uh, city officials within City Hall, particularly within um, the New Orleans uh, Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, which I'll talk about in a moment. We visited a number of key sites in the city that included operation and situation rooms that, that manage the city from official points of view, but also arts venues that were in and around New Orleans that looked out onto the city in different ways and that we argued later constituted sorts of situation rooms, spaces from which the city was understood, observed, thought through and managed in very similar ways, but with different objectives to the way in which formal operational or situation rooms uh, engaged. Um, we went to a number of live events in the city, uh, performances, music, dance, street performances to try to get a sense of how that city uh, works through performance practice and at the end of that trip we conducted a public symposium uh, that was very interdisciplinary and that drew uh, colleagues from across the city into conversation with one another about what they understood city resilience to be and how the arts might be always already engaged in addressing the challenges that cities face. That survey phase led to a series of workshops in 2019 that were targeted at key stakeholders in New Orleans. So we worked with colleagues in emergency preparedness uh, uh, and defining that quite broadly. So we were bringing in um, chief of police, chief of staff, head of emergency preparedness for the city, chief resilience officer, the mayor's chief of staff and colleagues that were working across New Orleans municipal um, functions at, at strategic levels, really to try and think through how encounters with arts practice in a city could be vital to the work that they were doing as professionals in the city. And to try and focus that conversation through uh, embodied experiences that these colleagues had had, and to think about the work that was happening in the city already, rather than thinking about kind of instrumentalized approaches to what the arts could do for the city. So in our work, we're really interested in the analysis of extant practice that art, artists and arts organizations are engaged in, and to think through the, the, the ways in which those artists are already strategic thinkers in the city, rather than to think about how we might might employ, let's say, visual artists to disseminate policy in uh, graphic mode, for example. Uh, so as well as working with City Hall colleagues, we worked with arts organisations in the city, particularly with uh, the Marini Opera House, the Southern Rep Theatre, the Arts Council of New Orleans, uh, Music Box Village, and an organisation called uh, MACNO, which is the Music and Culture Coalition of New Orleans. So bringing together different constituent parts into workshops that really try to articulate the relationship between cultural practice and resilience thinking. Uh, and in February of next year, we're going back to New Orleans to do further field research for a forthcoming book that we're writing together. And particularly we're going uh, in 2022 to interrogate and analyze the impact of COVID-19 and recent Hurricane Ida in that city. Yeah. So, this work um, has led to some pretty big changes in New Orleans, uh, and it just seems worth flagging that because the, the, the methodology that underpins the New Orleans work is the methodology that underpins the COVID work. So in bringing these different phases together, brokering these conversations and working with 
stakeholders across the city. We saw New Orleans Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness um, position themselves as, as being on a long-term path of embedding arts and culture practices within all of their strategic planning. So trying explicitly to call upon the knowledge that exists within culture and arts communities in the city in formalized ways that uh, en enliven and understand the work that that office is engaged in doing in, in useful and productive ways. And as a result, uh, emergency preparedness and resilience work, uh, we've been told by this office, uh, can benefit greatly from engagement with the arts and fundamentally should be understood through arts and culture in that city. New Orleans is a city of the arts. And when before we went, the arts weren't being plugged into these sorts of conversations. So now New Orleans Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness is understanding its work through the lenses of those practices in the city. Um, as I said, we worked with arts organisations. So the Arts Council of New Orleans is the major funder of uh, arts in uh, New Orleans. When we arrived to work with them, they were principally focused on the dissemination of funding to arts organisations across the city and to running live um, large scale events in New Orleans. But they weren't really engaged in a conversation with the city at a formal level, despite being a, a kind of at arm's length wing of City Hall. Subsequent to our work with them, trying to understand how turning to face the resilience challenges of the city might be useful to them, they're now much more fundamentally engaged in a conversation with uh, the city of New Orleans. And they've been brought into the strategic planning of the emergency preparedness team. So joining up the, the, the kind of um, formal organizational sides of emergency preparedness and resilience with the, the major kind of strategic funding body in the city was a key outcome of that work. We've also been working with the Southern Rep Theatre and um, they were uh, in the process of uh, reworking the church that you can see on the slide here into a theatre venue when we went in 2019. And there was, as a result of some of the, the, the sort of interventions that we made with that group, they um, positioned this building in a slightly different way so that it faced into the city, faced into the communities that it sits at the intersection of in um, fairly explicit ways uh, and try to bring communities into the building and into the practices that they're engaged with through different modes of operation that they hadn't perhaps been thinking about um, beforehand. And they describe this as representing a fundamental shift in their understanding of the role of the arts in the city's fabric. So really positioning the work that they're doing in uh, conversation with the challenges of the city. So not changing the work that they were doing, not, not attempting to uh, influence the, the, the artistic practices or strategy that they, they wanted to engage in, but rather trying to articulate that as a conversation with what the city was tackling already. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, that's probably an important point. We're not asking artists to change their practice here. We're interested in the work that artists make uh, and we're, we're trying to understand how that might allow us to think through uh, challenges in the city in different ways. So this work um, led us to look at COVID and the arrival of COVID and go, there must be a connection here. And so we took the existing methodology and we were awarded funding for an 18 month project uh, with a, a ridiculously long title. We should do shorter titles. Um, but uh, so we're focusing on sustaining social distancing and reimagining city life, performative strategies and practices for response and recovery in and beyond lockdown. And we developed this uh, through uh, funding uh, from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. This was a rapid response call, uh, one of uh, a number of funded projects to uh, address COVID. Uh, our concern was that um, practices such as social distancing or restrictions such as social distancing, there was a lack of explanation of how this might work. Uh, and there needed to be some productive thinking on how we might conceive of uh, restrictions to city life uh, while retaining uh, a sense of city life. Um, and so by 
employing this methodology, we sensed that we would be able to identify some artworks, uh, reflect on these, engage in conversations with practitioners in arts and resilience, uh, and then bring these together to make some recommendations. And the emphasis here was on was on quick work. Uh, and uh, so within an 18 month window, although that said, our work in New Orleans uh, covered an an 18 month window too so there was a, a neat echo there so we started in december of 2020 and we finish in may next year we're focusing on this work on three cities uh, bristol glasgow and newcastle uh, we'll also be disseminating uh, material and we're in conversation um, with with cities uh, elsewhere in the uk uh, we're also hoping there'll be international connections there too so in September, we produced our interim report, uh, roughly ju just after the halfway mark in the project. Uh, and this is very much a working document. This is not a finished set of ideas, which is uh, tricky as, as academics who are used to producing finished pieces of work, finished articles, book chapters, books, uh, to, to kind of go, this is our thinking at this point. And very much holding this talk now is an opportunity to kind of explore some of these ideas uh, in conversation and hopefully reveal their usefulness and tweak and refine and uh, develop further uh, as we uh, go through the remainder of the project. Uh, so you can download the report from our website, it's on our publications page. Uh, we also published an article in Crisis Response Journal, which was focused on resilience and emergency planning professionals uh, at the same time and pointed them to this this report. This report is primarily focused on resilience and emergency planners, inviting them to think about how the arts might be useful and giving some steps uh, in that direction. So that if you read this from the perspective, say, of the arts, you might you might notice that particularly, uh, and so we'll look at different ways of engaging with arts communities, but our, uh, one of the first publications we felt was important was begin to share that angle of the work. Um, one of the reasons uh, that we think this is quite an interesting time to engage in this kind of thinking is that we're recognising that COVID-19 has led to public calls uh, by emergency and resilience planners for new approaches to emergency planning. Um, and so we've got this quote here from Lagadak Ho and Langlois, who suggest that in a systematic or in a systemic hyper complex and mutating context, no one should expect to be the central and unique focus point. The distribution of expertise, questions, perspectives, dynamics and operations has to be rapid and wide. The way forward should be a collective endeavour anchored upon intelligence, creativity and trust. So there seems to be in... Um, relevant communities and resilience and emergency planning, a real interest in bringing multiple voices uh, into play. And if we think about cities, then artists and arts practitioners are particularly key to understanding what cities are. And so it seems particularly important that we involve those voices uh, in discussions on how we might better protect cities in the immediate moment and also going forward. And so from our work, we've also identified uh, the ways in which artists are responding as, as key to cities. So we suggest as artists respond to COVID-19, they discover ways of practicing life and work in our changed cities. Indeed, artists are exceptionally well placed to help reveal, articulate and encounter the questions that have been overlooked that are unseen. And that's uh, cited in the article on the previous slide. So as resilience professionals are identifying that there are questions that have been overlooked. So we suggest that performance practitioners, arts practitioners more broadly, are particularly well placed to engage in those. And so as a result of conversations with emergency planning colleagues across the um, key cities that we're working with, and as a result of being invited into um, committee meetings with core cities and, uh, and in our constituent groups, we, and also by um, analysing texts that have emerged from the city councils uh, responding to the, the, the challenges that the pandemic has thrown up, we've identified five key um, pandemic response challenges, things that have come up time and again in different contexts, perhaps phrased slightly differently, that we've drawn together in the report to crystallise um, the responses that we've been getting from the people we've been working with into coherent headings that we can respond to in the project. And we suggest that these five categories are the challenge of reaching communities in and across a city. Very often we were told that it was difficult to reach particular or constituent groups in cities for lots of different reasons um, from, a, from the city councils and emergency planning perspective. 
And so we're interrogating how the arts are extraordinarily well placed to be engaged in that work and indeed are and have been engaged in that work all the way through the pandemic. The second was to rework city spaces for safe public access. It's been common to hear people complaining about the ways in which the cities were places where you weren't allowed to venture into when the pandemic was at its height. And we were articulating that, we've been looking at that through both the emergency planning challenges that have thrown up and the ways in which um, artists and arts organisations are very often engaged in rethinking public space, engaged in interrogating space and place. The third is that we're looking uh, at ways to engage local populations with key public health messages. One of the key refrains of our research was that signs don't work. And so we've been interrogating how do we engage people in public health messages in interesting, playful ways? And I'll say some more about that in a moment. The fourth is to look at the way in which we can manage perceptions of life during COVID and of perceptions of the vaccination programmes. How do we get away from anxieties? How do we alleviate sense of not wanting to engage in how the world is and what the vaccine might do for us? And then the last is to look at ways in which the arts might be engaged in connecting people to alleviate isolation, ways of excitingly, playfully, imaginatively connect people at times when they are physically separated. So we've taken those five challenges and, uh, and, and attempted to engage in, in thinking through how we might address those for principally, I suppose, now for future pandemics, although who knows where the current situation will go. And so the work is very much live. It's engaged in thinking this through now, thinking it through from the perspective of having been on the project through a series of lockdowns. And now as we quote unquote emerge from the pandemic thinking about how this work might be useful going forward. So in addressing each of these we've been thinking about um, and analysing uh, recent contextual and critical research that's addressed these particular challenges that we've identified or allied ones and we take that academic research as a framework um, through which to identify um, case studies of arts projects uh, uh, in the key cities and internationally that we think are we are that we think are or can be through our research put into productive conversation with that contextual research and the wider emergency planning challenges and then engage in that analytical brokering to offer invitations to emergency and resilience professionals and we we're, we're categorizing these invitations through uh, a the key terms preparedness and response. Emergency planning falls into four key areas, generally speaking, mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. Our work is squarely focused in this middle bit, which in a sense is the kind of the, the, the activity that is at, at the, I don't know, the epicentre of the, the crisis unfolding, if you like. So we're not really looking at mitigation and we're not really looking at recovery, though it's a Venn diagram and so these things interconnect. But our invitations are invitations to engage in preparedness activity and in activity that responds to an unfolding crisis when it happens. We have five key areas, as I've said, and we don't have time in this talk to go through all of those, but we thought it would be useful just to outline the sorts of things that we've been talking about, the sorts of invitations that we've been making to key figures within the emergency preparedness world. And so we thought we'd uh, speak to you here about invitation number three, which is around the challenge of engaging local populations with key public health messages. Through the analysis work that we do in the report in that section, we offer this preparedness uh, invitation. The invitation is to work with artists in cities to reflect on the ways that signs can become critical constituent parts of the fabric of a city. Signs are ubiquitous before the pandemic and even more so now. And as a result, they become part of the noise of a street in a sense. And so we're looking for ways to avoid the, them disappearing into the background, to think about how can we be innovative here? How can we engage in practices that 
reflect on key public health messages, but that might do so in ways that are more innovative than simply writing down on a piece of metal, stay two metres apart. So we've been inviting colleagues to identify valuable places for playful and engaging signs in a city, which during a pandemic can offer a way of a city speaking to and with itself about urgent concerns. So we're suggesting that there are ways of engaging in public health messaging that are perhaps less instrumental than the ones that we've seen rolled out over the last 18 months. Ways of being in conversation with local populations. That's in the preparation phase, but of course, when a crisis unfolds, we have to respond to it. And so our invitation here in the response phase has been to consider the life cycle of messaging in, a sustain, in sustained pandemic conditions. That is, think about the ways in which initial signs or messages might be productively and playfully reworked later on. So as to avoid that sense of being constantly battered with the same message over and over again. How do we tweak those? Or how do we take and distill ideas from public health messaging into new modes of engaging with those that hark to the messaging that we are so used to, but enable us to explore it in ways that are safe, but in ways that are imaginative and engaging. And that follows on to recognizing that familiarity with instructions might not lead to continued action or adherence. So our invitation to, um, is, is to collaborate with arts practitioners to begin city projects that could retain public interest and commitment. And Stuart's gonna talk about one successful iteration of that that we've seen uh, as a result of the project now. Yeah, so this is a work, um, Rainbow's End, uh, created by Zoe Allen and Adam Dixon uh, and the Baltic Young Programmers, who are a group of young programmers working at Baltic uh, in Gateshead. Um, and it's uh, a, an artwork uh, painted onto the flagstones outside the entrance to the Baltic. Uh, and it caught our attention because we watched this person walking along the lines that are painted on uh, the flagstones. Uh, the artwork is is a swirl of shapes and lines and paths and patterns uh, and draws in words from public health messaging. So hands face is one and that appears on, on the cover of our report and it misses out the word space, which is in the public health messaging. Um, and and what's, by drawing these fragments together, it allows the person, the, the user of this space uh, perhaps, to re rewrite those words and write them into their contemporary experience of the city. Um, so it's not even finding a new way of telling us the same, the same message, it's making a slightly different message in that moment. Um, so Baltic suggests that the artwork uh, asks us to playfully explore our own lockdown journeys, negotiate conflicting information and consider to what extent we should follow the rules and which we might break along the way. And what this might do perhaps is suggest that there are alternative ways of revealing messages and we fully understand that uh, revealing public health messages is vital critical work and there's a need to do that but there might also be ways in which there could be alternative ways of engaging in that and we think this is quite an interesting one to share. In all of these examples, we're, we're, we're reflecting on work that happened before so-called Freedom Day uh, at various points in the last 18 months. So these are all live projects that are engaging in some way or another with the circumstances of, of, of being at, at the height of the pandemic in the UK and beyond and thinking that through in creative and engaging ways. And we wanted to share here the work of Slung Low, uh, a theatre company, a cultural Cultural College and a Woodland Management Organisation in Holbeck in Leeds. And their work, we suggest, particularly reaches communities in and across a city at a time when that can be very difficult. So Slunglow uh, run the Holbeck, which is the oldest social club in Britain, uh, based in Leeds in, in the area, Holbeck. Uh, and they, they do this through multiple different strands of activity and uh, and engage with the local community through the social club. So it's still an active social club, but it's also their theater venue, their, their artistic hub, their offices, and where they engage in their practice um, in this community. And the, uh, the artistic director, Alan Lane, um, said, said to us in interview that uh, 
Holbeck would be the hill on which they die as an arts organisation. And he means that in terms of wanting to engage in that community's future, wanting to be in conversation with a community that in a pandemic was extraordinarily at risk, had very high levels of uh, um, uh, uh, poverty, very high levels of ill health, uh, very high levels of obesity and food poverty, et cetera, et cetera. And so their work is calibrated within that context. And they, they engaged in a series of really interesting pieces of what we might think of as performance uh, engagements in place and community throughout the pandemic. Very early on, they curated an exhibition of locally made artworks that they, uh, against the wishes of the council, hung on lampposts. Uh, I think that they uh, all came together and agreed that it was a good idea in the end. But initially, it was, it was a sort of radical act to say, well, we're allowed out of our houses for an hour uh, at most for exercise only. How do we engage our communities? How do we connect people in that context of needing to be physically distanced? One of the ways in which they did that was that they called the community to create pieces of arts practice, pieces of, of visual art that they then curated into an exhibition that local community members could follow and explore and discover a way of engaging engaging in something joyful and interesting and exciting at a time when we were all supposed to be kept indoors. Later in the pandemic, they became one of the only non-means-tested food banks in the area, running a food distribution centre almost all the way through the pandemic. It started fairly early on. I think they began in April and they only finished again, they only finished this work in July. And they became the central hub for how people got to eat who couldn't afford to uh, during the pandemic, really fulfilling a, a local civic function. But one of the reasons that this is interesting in the context of performance is that they were engaged in much more than just giving out food. They were engaged in talking to people, connecting them, offering them help in different ways and being in conversation through the process of, of the, the food bank became vitally important for many people in that area. They were only able to do that work because of the ethos with which, with which they run this company, uh, a, a company that is open to everybody, a way of engaging that brings people in from uh, all sectors of society, I suppose. In June, I think it was of 2020, they um, held an outdoor socially distanced performance where family bubbles were invited into tents to watch a piece of theatre that unfolded on the back of a flatbed truck that they listened to through headphones with a live audio relay. Again, a mechanism by which people could come together in safe ways, physically distanced, to experience something collective that helps sustain the difficulty of being physically apart from other people to make it more bearable, we might argue. And then lastly is the piece of uh, art, uh, neon art that you can see on the slide. This sign was illuminated during their Christmas 2020 performance, their Christmas show, in which uh, they told a story about um, a, a community, a society that had been forced apart and kept uh, in their houses and that this event had stolen Christmas. It was a reflection of the times. But as part of that, they illuminated this sign that says, be careful, be kind, be useful, we go again tomorrow, pals. And they displayed it on the outside of their building and they articulate the way in which it became a call to action, a reminder that the pandemic was not over, that we needed to continue, but that we needed to do so in ways that were kind to one another, that could be imaginative, creative and engaging. This is a mode of cultural practice as pandemic response, we argue. So with our last example that we're going to share, and <clears throat> if we had more time, we'd share lots more. There's been some fascinating work. Um, this one addresses uh, point four, invitation four, to manage perceptions of life during a pandemic and a vaccination. And it, we went to uh, New Orleans again. Um, we'd always been keeping an eye on that through this project. And while we're focusing particularly on case study cities in the UK, we're also interested in examples nationally and internationally that seem interesting and might well lead to uh, interesting developments uh, in cities. And this was a focus on vaccine equity. And we were particularly interested in uh, the concern that 
uh, numbers of communities were at risk. Uh, and so a group was set up there, the Vaccine Equity and Communications Working Group, with members from faith, cultural disability, and Latino and Latina and Black community leaders. Uh, and as a result of the work of that community, there was a sense that by working with uh, Mardi Gras performers and uh, key um, uh, known faces in the city, uh, that might <clears throat> develop a sense that New Orleans could engage in vaccination, that this wasn't necessarily about individuals or the country, this was about a city and people in the city and the cultural practice of the city being a critical part of the vaccination program, a critical way in which the city addressed and engaged in vaccination. So alongside holding events where free music and free food were handed out, and particular food of the city were handed out for free alongside vaccinations being given. Um, there was also a campaign, particularly online, uh, the Sleeves Up NOLA campaign, where uh, Mardi Gras performers would either physically roll up their sleeves or indicate where on their arm the vaccine should be given. And they would reflect on why the vaccine was important to them, whether it was about seeing family, about continuing their culture, about continuing to dance, which in New Orleans is a critical part of the practice of the city. So the engagement with vaccination wasn't a sense of it's important to have a vaccination. It, it's, it's much more grounded in the city's identity. And for us, that begins to be a critical way uh, in which we can rethink uh, the engagement with uh, pandemic and the need to vaccinate. So all of these examples are ways in which arts practices broadly conceived and, and for Stuart and I as, as performance studies scholars, particularly performance, are engaged in thinking through the places from which that work emerges, the, the place physically, the place culturally, practically, how is performance practice, how is arts practice engaged in thinking through the challenges of the world around us? And at the end of the, the report, we offer a, a series of bullet points, ways of thinking further with this. And we thought we'd share four here that seem pertinent both to the examples that we've shared and to the work that we're, we're turning to face in the coming months. The first is that locally situated arts practices reveal new ways of understanding and reimagining city life during and post pandemic. As Stuart was articulating with the New Orleans example, cultural practices in and of a city, food, music, dancing, performance, all offer ways of a community being in conversation with itself about the challenges that it faces. As I said earlier, signs don't work was a constant refrain in the conversations that we've been having over the last few months as we've begun this research. But what we've discovered is that performative interventions into city spaces can work. They can make a difference into the way in which people behave and how we draw attention to the things that we have to do to stay safe. One of the examples that we found of that was in Glasgow where a wavy line separated one side of a room from another rather than a straight line. And people seem to engage much more fully and freely and happily in that division and that keeping safe through discovery than they did when it was um, on the streets of Newcastle, where there are great big straight lines that tell people to go in certain ways with certain arrows and nobody seemed to care. So signs don't work, but performative interventions can. In engaging the public, playful approaches to safety, safely practicing a city can provide compelling means of addressing risks in creative embodied ways. I think one of the things that we're really reaching towards with this interim report is to encourage playfulness, even as we're facing difficulty and crisis, to encourage ways of thinking about being in places safely, but enjoyably, to find modes of existing in uh, the context of a pandemic where we are able to safely connect with one another through the spaces that we inhabit. And the last thing that we wanted to share, which we think is really vital to this, and I suppose harks back to the framing that Stuart outlined at the beginning of the talk, is that emergency planners are open to and they're actively seeking out opportunities for interdisciplinary ways of working and of developing their strategies for this work. There is a really clear sense that practical constraints permitting, emergency planners want to think in new ways and innovative ways about the work that they're doing. And so we're hoping as we move further into this work that we can facilitate some of that collaborative thinking going forward. 
that's about it from us for now. So um, thank you very much. And we're really very happy to take any questions that might have arisen. Thank you, Patrick. Stuart. Um, <clears throat> the questions are already flying in, which is great. Uh, interestingly, one of them picks up on the last point you've, uh, you were just making there about emergency planners. And actually, uh, they ask, how do you convince emergency planners that play is not a risk? And what advice might you give to artists that are going into similar conversations? So a, a really good question. Um, I think one of, one of the things that we've been very fortunate with is that we've had access to emergency planners and resilience professionals and we're, we're bringing uh, we're bringing uh, academic expertise and brokering skills to that conversation that I think are helpful just in terms of positioning but also one of the things that we've encountered is that most arts organizations and artists tend to approach um, municipal centers and councils through culture teams and actually Culture teams are stressed in their own ways. They've got their own priorities and problems, and perhaps they're not attending to the same questions that um, emergency planners and resilience professionals are. So one of the key things I think is think carefully about where you want to position your work and how you want to have that conversation with a city council, for example. How can we engage in these practices is partly bound up in who we're having the conversations with. So one of the things that we found is that resilience professionals and emergency planners are obviously engaged in doing their work. They want to be really precise in that, but they are open to the possibility that there are other ways of thinking and being in cities. So I, I think open conversation, being really clear about what you are trying to do and what you're not trying to do early is really important. And I think being attentive to the fact that that when we're trying to do this work we have to be in conversation it's not it's not just a one-way street there has to be a, a mutuality to it Stuart have I missed anything um I don't think so I think <clears throat> if I was to pick a different angle I think there the pandemic poses a challenge because there are very immediate concerns and so when we were writing the report the, by focusing on preparedness and response when we were giving recommendations to emergency planners about how they might engage with artists um, and we also gave some <clears throat> cautions about paying artists and things like that so we did contextualize that um, but there are things that we think that emergency planners might interest might do if they were interested by phoning up artists and go can you do this now or can we talk about this now or can you tell us about this um, and there's longer term stuff um, and the longer term stuff feels like it's the more sustainable, the more valuable to both. Um, and probably the brokering is about drawing connections, but also sitting down with organisations and going, what are you doing? How's it working? What would you like to do? Certainly working with Southern Rep in New Orleans, who had been uh, without a venue after 12 years touring in the city and then suddenly having a venue. That notion of what, what do you want the venue to be and how do you want to connect to the neighbours and what, how does all this work? So those kind of conversations and actually revealing the degree to which they were already doing resilience practice and that could then be framed as resilience practice or contributing to the city's resilience even before engaging in a conversation with resilient stakeholders. So understanding work is already being done, that's, that's vitally important. Um, so yeah, I think as uh, extending the conversations, allowing them to unfold carefully and not rushing to the first thing um, to be done, um, <clears throat> unless it's in relation to a pandemic where there, there might be some urgent things that would start stuff off. Right, uh, just kind of following on from that then, that, like, I'm, I'm going to interject with a question of my own, if I may. Um, how have you dealt with the kind of the role of power in these conversations? Like, for example, just very specifically from my own knowledge in like New Orleans, post-Katrina, during Katrina, there was a big clash between um, FEMA and like some of the organisations you've mentioned and people like Food Not Bombs, who are more kind of grassroots organised. And there was a real battle over who was allowed to help. So I wonder like, how how have you approached like grassroots DIY artist networks, which are often not don't often get a seat at the table when kind of emergency planning, for example, might well, they might not be interested necessarily, but like um, they don't have that seat at the table. Like how what's what's that been like in terms of the research? So it's a really good question, and it's a it it continues to be a challenge. I don't I don't think that it's something that is going to be fixed in in kind of complete terms. But I think projects like ours are, are partly about revealing the powerful work that those organisations are doing and, and, and revealing that, that you don't have to um, silo practices 
and say, well, we do the recovery, we do the emergency planning, you go over there and do that later. Actually, it's about how are these things mutually uh, engaged? How are these things powerful for each other? And partly that's about what Stuart's just been talking about. It's about ways of turning uh, artistic practice to face the concerns of a city or the challenges of a city, not to change your practice, not to engage in activity that you don't want to be engaged in, but actually to, to articulate your practice in relationship to those questions, concerns and priorities as a way of positioning that work as valuable, important and powerful in those contexts. I think we're, we're kind of painfully aware of how complicated it can be to break down power dynamics and barriers. Um, we, we've had difficult meetings in New Orleans in those grassroots contexts where as two white guys walking into a predominantly black city, it's really problematic. And we occupy a position of, of power because of our whiteness that is globally problematic and rightly being held up as needing to be queried. So, so that, that, that continues to be a conversation that we have to be actively engaged in and try to position ourselves within in productive ways. But for us, the, the methodology of the work here is about conversation and brokering and bringing people together and facilitating conversation across those divides and trying to do that. So much of our work keeps, this is gonna sound an awful lot worse than I think it should, much of our work keeps groups apart in the early phases. So we worked with New Orleans City Hall and we've been working with city councils here to do work that, that helps to articulate the value of thinking in these terms before we then bring those groups together to say, actually, here are ways of thinking and working together. And similarly, we're trying to, we, you know, we worked with the Arts Council of New Orleans on their own first to say, here are ways in which thinking about resilience challenges could both be fascinating, exciting, enlivening, but also could be productive in practical terms about the positioning of your work in the city and its, its function within those emergency contexts. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from the chat. Um, uh, someone says, uh, you mentioned signs don't work, but do you think the Baltic piece, for example, would have worked without the context of the existing public health messaging? Uh, yes, that's a, a good question because it needed the original signs to be able to break them down and fragment them and playfully engage with them. Um, and would a work that's playfully engaging on its own actually reveal messages? I think our, our sense is there's an opportunity for more thinking about particularly the duration. It was very clear the pandemic wasn't going to go away quickly. And so that social distancing and mask wearing were going to need to be around for a while and they were going to be odd. And uh, so we need to find potentially ways in cities to address that, to reveal a changing experiences of that, attend to it, make it somehow alive because signs that just get ignored feel like it's the wrong kind of way. So um, yes, probably there, there might've been need for uh, a fiscal messaging. I'm, I'm sure there is, but maybe there are ways of understanding how messages can be got out uh, in more plural ways uh, and more city specific ways um, and that's probably like in New Orleans with the sleeves up NOLA uh, a, a local group may be gathering together to muse on how messages might be presented in certain spaces those kind of conversations feel like they might be new ways of working um, and might be very productive spaces for people from uh, varying communities in the city and arts makers uh, and thinkers and uh, resilience professionals. Thank you. Uh, that is the last question from the chat. So I want to say a massive thank you to you both for taking time to talk to us today and for letting us have some insight into practice. Um, I think this is one of those ones that people are going to be revisiting for a while. Um, uh, for those of you watching, next week's talk is our first one live from the building and you can book tickets now. There are limited spaces because we have some social distancing still going on. So do book in and we can't wait to see you in the building for the first time since the first lockdown. Uh, all that long time ago. Uh, I'm not going to put a number on it because it still feels weird to say that number out loud. In this next lunchtime talk though, Kathleen Shepherd is going to share the research and findings arising from her practice and research PhD, Caring to Listen, which examines how working class experience is excluded from socially engaged art. You can get news on all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, by following us on at PMStudio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, 
or subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget before you go, hit subscribe on this YouTube channel so you don't miss out on all our latest content. And while you're there, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. This is the point where I normally say, thanks for watching. We'll see you all again here, same time, same place next week. But if you're quick and you grab a ticket, I might just see you in the studio as well. Thanks for watching.